Thanks for making room. We know it's a holiday weekend and you still made room for time with the family of God and time with God to be important to you. We, we thank you for that. Thank you so much. What we're going to do in this service today is we're going to make room and we're going to ask you guys to make room. Make room in your minds. Make room in your hearts. Make room for the wisdom in the spirit of God. When I say that we've made room, I mean, guys, we've we made a room. We've made a room. And uh, I'm going to sit down, so I'm going to go ahead and invite you guys to have a seat. And I want to welcome everyone to what we love to call, we name everything. Why not? We call this the Lifehouse Lounge. It's not the lounge where you serve drinks. We have a missions cafe, um, you know, but it's closed now. You know what I mean? Um, so you can go there. Uh, but at this lounge, it's all about discussion. And we definitely believe that people can know God and find family. And one of the things that families do, healthy families, I mean, sometimes I use loud voices and colorful words, but most of the time, healthy families know how to have discussions. And that's what we want to do today. We, we just want to have a discussion. So, I mean, before we do that, I want you guys, some of you guys already know who's up here, but it's always good for them to just let you know who they are. Would you guys just take a moment? Ladies first, take a moment. Tell everyone who you are. Tell them a little about what you do, too. That's awesome. Sure. I'm Shalisha Kerr, and I'm the music director here at Lifehouse. So you make sure that... We're hitting our notes. Try. Yeah. Does Shalisha get to keep her job, you guys? Try. We might. <laughs> Trying to do it. Because we, I mean, we, we legit will fire you. Like, we, music's important to us. Like, sorry, bro. We love you. You can sit out there, but you can't. You can't be telling. No, you can't do that. We can't be hitting notes. No, we got. We. <laughs> I'm Sheree. <laughs> I'm Sheree Bishop. I'm the creative arts pastor here at Lifehouse. Sorry, what, what does that, no, you're also, she's being, she's giving you the humble part. What does that mean? No, no, because she's the worship pastor, but you're also the, the creative arts executive. How snobby of a title. Creative arts executive. Not up there. I, I mean, like, <laughs> tell, like, what, what, you oversee in that role, I mean, you see, oversee everything like, that happens in a service, oh, right? Goodness. The lights are on, the graphics, the songs we pick, all that yeah, kind of stuff. Worship production. Media, yeah. communication. So if you'd like your email, because of all your complaints about what we do in the service, I'll be happy to provide that for you right after service. She's the one that you blame if you don't like how we get down. <laughs> Last but not least. Yeah, so my name is Kurt Snyder, and I am the discipleship pastor here. Discipleship, but, you know, you make sure the missions happen, too. Yeah, so we do missions, outreach, yeah. groups, leadership college. All those good things, yeah. And these two great chairs are from your office. Yeah, they stole my furniture. <laughs> the Lifehouse Lounge so, is a hodgepodge. Is anybody that will share their furniture with us? So if you'd like to donate yours, <laughs> we're open, we're open the couches. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact. Just make sure they get back. Shalisha and Sharaya are sisters, just in case you didn't know that. Maybe some of you figured it out, but they're sisters, which is pretty cool. Just like Kurt and I are brothers. That's right, brothers <laughs> from another mother. <laughs> yeah, and you see it? You see it? <laughs> we look alike. Brothers and Christ. That's what it is. Uh, you guys don't appreciate that. From just, another mother. That just makes you old. That's all. <laughs> I promised myself that I was not going to make one old joke about Kurt, but since you did that, <laughs> no, no, just, I'm used just, to it. Just, just play it. <laughs> uh, as we are bringing the month of May to an end, there's two uh, topics that come up in May that I wanted to address, bring our attention to. The first one is I hope that this time tomorrow you are immersed in charcoal smoke. I hope hope that you got a cookout planned. I hope that plenty of you have a day off and that you enjoy Memorial Day. Um, but we want to first make sure that in that um, we acknowledge why uh, we have a holiday like Memorial Day. We honor and value those who gave all they had to give us all that we have. Uh, what I would like to do is do we have any military in the room that would be courageous enough to just stand at your seat? It worked first service. There we go. Shout out to all of our military. Big thank you. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Not only those who gave and passed, but we, we love those who are serving now that would make the same commitment. So thank you guys for giving us that. Now from there, I got to make a segue from applause to, I guess, a pause. That was nice, Spence. And then, um, you know, going into our next topic, 7% of our soldiers will suffer from what you guys know commonly as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. 6% um, of all citizens, just people here in America alone, 6% will suffer from the same. They'll suffer from PTSD. 
May is also Mental Health Awareness Month. And I hope that as I say that, in a setting like this, in a church, that you're already at least primed with the precursor question, which is, um, how do those two come together? Do they come together? Are they supposed to come together? What, what is the church's role and position? And like, what, you know, what? And, and it brings up these questions. And Shalisha is going to help us out a lot today with, if there's one thing that she is great at, it is, it is information and capturing it. I mean, she is down to detail. She's an avid note taker. I'm convinced she wrote part of the Bible because she's just, I mean, she's got the details and, and she knows it. And Shalisha, you, you have some information for us just to start this conversation off about this matter. Yes, but it's important to note that these statistics are from before yes. the pandemic. Yes, so, so as she reads them out, pre-2020, take your guess of where the number is, has gone. After the, after the pandemic. Probably higher. Uh, so 23% of pastors in 2019 acknowledge that they have personally struggled with a mental illness. And almost half of pastors say that they rarely or never speak to their congregation. Wow. that's half. About mental half illness. Of all the churches we have here. And then about 65% of church going family members of those with a mental illness want their church to talk openly about it. And 59% of those actually suffering from mental illness say the same. So the number of desire to talk about it is actually bigger than the number that actually is talking about it. Right. But that was also before the pandemic. And it was also before. So, so picture what you think about 23% of pastors suffering from it. Um, 50%. Hopefully the number that went up was the amount maybe that talk about it. So, so, look, so maybe today us four won't be able to answer the question, should the church talk about it? But I think the question that we can answer is, could, could the church talk about it? Can we? And we are. We are going to talk about it. Because if I have anything to say about it, I hear a number like 23% of pastors are struggling with some mental issues. I think it's pretty clear which number I fall in in those circumstances. And we're going, we're going to talk about it. Spence can be a little crazy. His hat's backwards sometimes. So, like, I, I, I want us to talk about this um, today. And so... To start it off, let, let's do this. We're going to start off at probably the most easiest place and the most common place, no matter where you fall on this discussion of mental health, mental illness, mental disorder, any of that, no matter where you fall on that, one thing we all have are our thoughts. We're going to start there. And uh, show of hands, please, and actually raise your hand. Show of hands if you were here for Easter. Let me see. If you were here for our Easter service, thank you for being here, by the way. If you were here for Easter, you know that we shared a story. We shared Sarah's story, um, her story of her battle with cancer. And I, I can relate to Kurt a lot. I want to come back to that later on. Um, but, you know, Kurt sat in the position because Kurt is Sarah's husband. Uh, oh, my gosh. Kurt. Kurt is, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I said that backwards. I was, you missed I was, it. <laughs> Kurt is Sarah's husband, yes. Okay, I was thinking Sarah the husband. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. That's not what I meant. Kurt is Sarah's husband. And um, I thought about what he must have gone through. As she shared everything she went through, he was the support system. He had to be on the outside looking in to her world and then also enduring it himself. And so it, it brought questions in my mind of like, I really would like to ask Kurt. As, as you two went through that as a couple, we know what she was facing. What, if you would be vulnerable, like what was it like, and, and particularly in the thought realm, like what was it like for you going through a challenge in time like that? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of times we can, we can identify with the person going through the issue because we know it's a little more visible, right? We know they, they had the illness, they had the surgeries, they had whatever. Uh, and so we can empathize, sympathize, whatever the word is with them. But what we forget is there's other people involved. Um, and so for those of you who weren't here, didn't get to raise your hand, I'll give you a real quick uh, synopsis of what the story was. So in 2015, uh, my wife was diagnosed with a pretty aggressive type of breast cancer. Uh, she Pretty quickly, we ended up in a surgery, so she had a bilateral mastectomy and then a full round of pretty aggressive chemotherapy. Right on the heels of that round of chemotherapy, we also found out that she had ovarian cancer. So another quick surgery, a full hysterectomy, and another full round of chemotherapy. So that took about two years. Um, so in that two-year process, uh, you know, obviously she had surgeries, things like that. Uh, There's a lot of things. So I became the primary caregiver after, after the surgeries. And um, because of the, you know, she came out of surgery, she had some drains. They had to be kept clean, just things like that, just 
doing the things that she couldn't do anymore. Well, one of the things she couldn't do was she couldn't sleep in a bed. Uh, and so she started sleeping in a recliner in the living room. So being the great husband that I am, <laughs> I decided I would, I would sleep on the couch. All right, so my wife's number one all Either the time. Either dedication just or just two. old mistakes that you yeah, owned yeah. before. Like, so whatever. I slept on the couch. Now, I'm six foot four. I have not found a couch that is long enough to be comfortable. You either got your feet up on one end or your head up on the other end. It just doesn't work. I'm grateful that he's willing to demonstrate here. And just yeah, I'm just laying down here. No, that's not happening. Um, so I was doing that. Um, also, you know, there was the, the, the monthly... You know, I, I mentioned we got the second diagnosis uh, pretty quickly. We had the monthly checkups, and so there was always that anxiety of going through, like, okay, what if they find something else? They already found something one other time. What if they find another tumor somewhere that we didn't know about? And then there's this thing called necrosis. And I don't know if you all know what necrosis is, but when any, whenever you have a surgery, obviously they cut away tissue. Uh, there is the potential that the tissue around where they cut will die. And if it dies, that's known as necrosis. And so um, when one of the primary ways or one of the ways that breast cancer is discovered is somebody will be doing an exam and they will find a lump or a bump, right? Well, what necrosis does when that tissue dies, it creates a lump. Well, several times through the process of going through, you know, recovery, my wife would find a bump or a lump. And so, again, you're going right back to that same place where, well, maybe that's another tumor. Maybe that's more cancer that they didn't get. And so you're sitting in that waiting period trying to figure out whether it's cancer or not. And one thing that was not part of her story, although she was living it at the same time, is just a few months before her first cancer diagnosis, we had gone through a major ministry leadership role transition. And in that transition, there was a lot of things said, some accusations made about me, about my family, um, that were pretty harmful because it came from people who were very close to us in the ministry. And so... I was struggling through all those thoughts, like all the questions, right? You get, you get them all, like why us? Why now? What if I am what they said I am? And it, and it didn't just have to be the things you heard externally. You were generating these, oh, these are all challenging questions inside. on your own, yeah. Yeah, all coming from inside my head. Uh, and I've been in ministry for 20 years, right? And so all these things are coming up. All these things are going on. I'm trying to figure all this out in my head. Um, and something that I knew but it became very evident to me in that moment was our mind is the battleground for our soul. One more time. Our mind, our mind is the battleground for our soul. Most of the spiritual battles we fight are in our mind. Right. Right. You know, a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter six, I believe it's verse 21 says we do not, our battles not against flesh and blood, but it's against powers and unseen places. And what's more unseen than our mind. Right. Right. You know, we don't, we don't get to see it. Uh, and we have an intelligent enemy. He knows how to come at us. You know, most of us would look out and we would see things and we would judge them as wrong or sin or bad or whatever. We go, well, I never do that. And probably we wouldn't. But the way our enemy works is he tries to plant thoughts. He tries to plant doubt. He tries to plant fear in our heads, into our minds, so that we have to stew on it. It's it's how he gets us. If you want some proof, let me take you back all the way to Genesis, the first book of the Bible with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Right. The serpent didn't walk up and go, hey, Eve, here's an apple. Right, right. Have this. No, he, he, he was a little more sly than that, right? So he comes in and he goes, did God really say you shouldn't eat from that tree? And then he backs it up. He, he's super slick. He backs it up. And he says, well, even if he did say it, and I paraphrase, this isn't actually how it's written. But if he did say it, he only said it because if you eat it, he knows you'll be like him. Yeah. And so he plants that thought. He plants that ego, right? And it's easy. It's so easy to get caught up in our thoughts. And Because here's the, here's the problem. There was a study done in 2005 by, I think, the National Science Foundation. And they said that we have, a person has between 50,000 and 80,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. But the worst part is 80%. Four out of every five of our thoughts are negative, and 95% of those are repetitive or recurring. And here's the thing. The more, we think, yeah, yeah. the more we think about it, the more likely we are to believe it, and the more likely we are to act on it. And so 
during that time, I have all these thoughts going, right? All the questions, all the fears, all the doubts, all the anxiety uh, going through my head. And uh, God gave me a scripture. I believe he gave it to me. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, it's verses 4 through 5. And it says this. It says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So we have this power, right? We have, we have weapons that demolish these powers. But then it says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension. All the doubts, yeah. all the fake that gets put in it, we demolish those because uh, all the, arg- um, I'm sorry, all the arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And then it says this, and we take captive every thought yes. to make it obedient right. to Christ. Take captive every thought. You see, when something's taken captive, right, it's contained. It's contained, yeah. It's, it's constrained. Uh, it doesn't have freedom. It's bound. And it says we're supposed to do this with our thoughts. We take our thoughts captive, you know, and so it, it doesn't have the ability to just run amok and do right. whatever it wants to. It doesn't have the ability. When we take it captive, it can't just control us. But I got to be really, really honest. I would love to be able to say God gave me that scripture and in yeah. all that moment, everything was great. But I can tell you, even just working on this message and thinking through this process, those same emotions, those same feelings started coming back. Because when you're in the middle of the chaos, taking every thought captive right. is really, really hard. Because yeah, you, you said every thought. Like, I, I honestly think that it adds, like, more of a concern. It's supposed to be, like, an empowerment to us, and it is. But to me, it adds, like, a concern because even the word captive, I hear the word cat. And I think that, I think that like, taking our thoughts captive sounds like herding cats. Like, it's, like, really, how do you, like, like, you're a Ghostbuster? Like, you're catching little, like, thoughts? You know what I mean, like, and I, I honestly think it feels, like, impossible. Even though I know this is what we're supposed to do, I just see the challenge in it. Like, their thoughts are running wild. How do you grab them and place them in submission where they go? Now, I've, I've, I've had this talk with Shalisha before. I've heard her teach on it, and that's why I wanted her to be a part of this discussion today because... I know, Shalisha, you have really great insight on this. I feel like this is good to tail off of Kurt because when we say, how do I, how do, I do it? I, I think it's difficult. We don't want to just, like, give, like, here's the, here's the one verse you need to go get tatted on you next, and I'm telling you your thought life will be completely different. Like, how do, how do we do it? What lasso are we using to, like, take our thoughts captive? Well, yeah, like, in verses exactly like that, even though we don't want it to seem like just something cute that we embroider on a pillow, but they actually, those verses can be helpful because for me, that specific one reminds me that if we have a relationship with God, we actually have tools and resources through God that can help us be mentally healthier. And so specifically today, I think we're we're all sort of talking about the most common types of mental illness, like anxiety Mm -hmm. and depression. Uh, And just a quick disclaimer, when I'm talking about anxiety, I'm not talking about severe panic disorders or PTSD because they can be be really severe. I'm talking more about the general anxiety that I feel like we all or or most of us have felt at some point or another and some people struggle with consistently um, and especially when it comes to things like a pandemic or whatever it is that we may be going through. And so I think that when we think of anxiety, we need to realize that this is something that was common all the way back in the Bible times. Something new. It's not new. It's something that people have struggled with for thousands of years. In places like Psalm 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious, anxious thoughts. Anxious thoughts. So this is something that they struggled with even then. And when I think about the word anxiety, again, this is not not personally, just in general, <laughs> can't possibly be something I've experienced. I think about things like worst case scenario thinking. Yeah. I think about those ruminating thoughts that just repeat over and over and over again. I think about negativity. I think about intrusive thoughts. I think about just consistent worry. And most of all, I think about fear. Yeah. And so for all of those things, the Bible does give us ways that we can combat those types of thoughts. So in Romans 12, 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we've all heard that before, or a lot of us have heard that before. But to me, that's not just a verse of comfort or encouragement, but it it actually shows solutions that we actually have the ability to do this. And so when you're talking, Kurt, about 
minimum 50,000 thoughts a day. And a lot of us have more. I know I have more. Um, <laughs> and we think about how you said that so many of them are just repetitive and so many of them are negative. There's even more bad news, guys, because I have read some research that shows that about 90% of those things don't actually happen. And so the thing is that when we think about and, and that of those, sounds like such a waste. Well, it is. All of your mind power is circulating around these what ifs or these horrible things, and then they don't even happen. Exactly. And it's not even just a waste of mind, space, or time, or energy. But when you have these things happening on a consistent basis, they can cause chronic stress. Mm. They can cause destructive worry, like not anything helpful or, or productive at all. And they can actually cause a long list of physical symptoms. So we can actually make ourselves physically sick by just letting these things continue and continue. And to know that over 90% of those things won't actually happen, it makes it feel so frustrating that we let this continue. And I have one more piece of bad news, but don't worry, there's good news coming. But the last piece of bad news is that I've been reading also that neuroscientists who study the pathways of the brain are suggesting that for every one negative thought we have, it takes at least three positive thoughts to counter it. And some are saying upwards of five. So three to five, positive to negative. Now, I don't know about you. You guys might all be really good at this, but I know for me personally, I don't sit there when I have a negative thought and think, well, wait a minute, before I let this continue, I have to think of three positive things. <laughs> I know that I'm not doing that. So how do we even balance this? How do we even get past this? So that's the bad news. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you guys aren't panicking. Can you think of food? Like, is that, is that an option? Sure, you that think counts of? as okay. a positive, right, okay. I think. That sounds good. Anything that brings you joy. So the good news is that God knows this about us. He knows the science, he knows the way our brains are wired, and he knows the enemy's tactics. He knows that we have a tendency to veer toward and stick in the negative. Right. And so I think that, I believe that that's why the Bible says hundreds of times something to the effect of, do not be afraid. Be afraid, yeah. Hundreds of times you can find that in the Bible, do not be afraid. And I just feel like that implies that we're capable of controlling this, because I don't think God would tell us to do something if we weren't capable and that's, of doing it. Because that's what the verse says. It tells it, you not. take them captive, yes. you do it. It tells us that we are capable of this. And even Jesus implied that when he was teaching. He said in John 14, 27, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Mm. So here he says it again. So don't be troubled or afraid. And he actually has another sermon that he teaches where he gives a whole section about worry. He talks about the birds and the flowers mm -hmm. and how much they're taken care of and provided for and how much more important we are than they are. And so in that section of his sermon where he talks about worry, a couple of things stand out to me. The first thing is, he says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? All right. So he's actually implying the same thing that we said. It's a waste of time and right. energy. But he also says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. To me, that's a really practical piece of advice because what he's saying is when we feel overwhelmed or when we feel anxious about so many things, we can break it down into smaller pieces. We can think just about today. We can think just about what we can control and what we can't control or what can wait till tomorrow, we can try to put that away and put it aside so that we don't become overwhelmed by everything that's happening right now. Um, but with all that being said, I, you asked me about the how, and I do get stuck in the how. I, I hear these. Because even, what you, because even what you just said, Jesus said, oh, don't worry about tomorrow. It'll take care of itself. Because there's trouble today. There's like, that doesn't make me feel any better. There is stuff to worry about. There is, that 10%. <laughs> well, you know? I need help with those troubles right, yeah. right now. I need right now. And so, yeah, and I have grown up hearing these verses over and over again. And it is something that we can just throw out there. But I really, really, truly believe that these can be valuable for us to think of step-by-step -step ways that we can just slowly start to move that, that negative toward the positive. And so the first one that I want to share with you today that's really helped me personally is 1 Peter 5, 7. And I've tried to apply this every single day. It says, give all your worries and cares to God, right. for he cares about you. Now, that sounds nice. <laughs> Just give them to God. But here's the kicker. Not 
picking it back up again yes. five minutes later. So not just surrendering it over and say, like we even sang today, we said, here's where I lay it down. This is my surrender. But are we singing those words in the song? And then by the time service is over, we're worried again. And that's the, the difference is how do we surrender and truly release our burdens to God and not pick them back up? To me, the only solution to that is if you trust God. Mm -hmm. And so Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your paths. So to me, it's it sounds simple. It's hard to actually do, but the concept is easy where you surrender and release because you trust. Because I can trust that I don't know as much as God knows and that his plans are better for me than the plans that I have for myself. And so I can truly, really release it knowing that he wants to take care of me. And I like to think of it this way. For those of you in the room or joining us online who are parents, if at night you tuck your child in and you say goodnight and you close the door, you don't expect for them to be awake all night with a stomach ache, worrying about whether the electric bill is gonna be paid mm. or whether there's gonna be enough groceries in the refrigerator. Right. You want them to sleep soundly, feeling safe and feeling secure. And so you as the parent are willing to take on the responsibility and carry and shoulder those burdens so that they don't have to. Right. And I really feel that's how God sees us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to care for us. And he doesn't want us to have to carry all of those burdens. So I think those are great tools to start. And then I feel like the last part is I really want to address this ratio one more time. Three to five positive thoughts to one negative. How in the world could we possibly start to make any difference in this? Well, there's another passage I wanna share, and this one's a little bit long, so I hope you'll bear with me and see why I'm choosing to read the whole thing because this, I think, is the key to that ratio there. Philippians 4, 4 through 9, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Now listen to this part. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the peace of God, there's that word again, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds, and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now this next part has a list. I love lists. This list, I hope you can see why I'm including it and maybe you can think about what all of these have in common. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, mm -hmm. whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, mm -hmm. if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about think such things. Yep. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So that, that list there is all things that are positive and that bring joy. And so that list is there, I believe, as a way to kind of combat that ratio in a way. To like be God, able to as if he out. knew yeah. that our ratio would be out of whack. And that we need this. Yeah. It's not just a platitude to just say, oh, think about the positive things, but it's actually a, a scientific tool to try to help bring peace. So prayer is not just connecting with God. It's a way to protect our minds and bring peace to our minds. And something that Jay Recto actually said, our campus pastor at Frederick, shout out to Jay. He said, pray before you panic. Mm. And I think that's a really applicable statement for today, what we're talking about. Because if we yes. remember that over 90% of the things we worry about won't even happen, don't panic. Try to pray first <laughs> and really release things and to God. Find the truth find in those truth. lists of things. There's still joys that we have. Yes. There are still things that are true that we have. Yeah. And, and the big thing is, it, it's really a gift for those of us who have a relationship with God. If we, if we have accepted Jesus, then we know that his spirit Yes. is within us. So he's in our souls, he's in our minds. So at any point, we have access to him. Right. He's available at all times. And so we, if we find ourselves in the negative, if we find ourselves ruminating, if we find ourselves getting overwhelmed and anxious, at any point in time, we can surrender those things to him. And just remember that he wants to carry those for us and he wants yeah. to take care of us. Yeah. So then I'll, I'll present maybe like a struggle or a challenge with this and maybe some people here are kind of feeling this too. Like, I won't even say it's like a counter perspective. I'll say it's an important part of the process in dealing with all of this. So I feel like before we can even get to that place, 
where we can choose joy and choose to speak life and all of those things, we actually have to like address the pain and heal from trauma or whatever we're struggling with mentally. And, you know, we've talked about this personally. We're, as you said, we're sisters. We grew up in the church. We've heard these verses our whole life. We know where to find them and we know them to be true. But um, what happens when your mental health is struggling so much that you're having a hard time believing the truth for so, yourself? Well, so, so you just, because you just said something really powerful. It, <laughs> it's, it, we're here in a church setting. It's obvious that we're going to speak the word of God. We're, this is what we believe in. We're going to point you in this direction to everything that we do. <laughs> Except for this one problem, say it again, except for this problem that what if... What if your mental health is struggling so much that you're having a hard time believing the truth for yourself? And this is something that I personally struggled with when I was going through depression. And I was really wrestling with it with my therapist of just being like, no, I, I understand, like I, I know these verses, I have all of the answers to the things that I'm even bringing to you. I know what I would say if someone was bringing. You, you it have to the me. formula. You like have. You have it. I like. I know these things, but something else is happening. Like mm. something is blocking those things. It's. It felt like a dark cloud was just like surrounding me on every avenue and blocking those truths. It was like my brain was not letting me accept <laughs> those things, and that was a really dark place to be. And it was a really confusing place to be, especially as a Christian, um, because I, I will say, I don't think that the church has done the greatest job of preparing us for this or teaching us about this or making us um, aware that it's normal <laughs> to go through it. Um, and it's because a lot of Christians will closely tie our mental health with our spiritual maturity and therefore assume if our mental health is struggling, then there must be something wrong with mm. your relationship with God. Mm. And that is not fair, and that's not true, because we know that trauma yeah. chemically affects our brains severely. And that trauma can come from things completely out of our control. Yeah. It can come from p things that people have done to us, secondhand pain, sudden loss, a pandemic, for goodness sake. Yeah. Like the whole entire world went through a traumatic event, and we're wondering why this is such a crisis. It can be um, things from our upbringing that maybe we've suppressed. I mean, it, it, it can be just so many things. Um, so it's not entirely fair to assume that there's something wrong <laughs> with our relationship right. with God because we're struggling mentally. Um, and here's the thing. There is absolutely supernatural power that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Amen. We Amen. know that, but it's okay to ask for help from yep. people Amen. too. Because God speaks to us in so many different ways. And one of those ways is through other people. Yeah. So we know that God can absolutely work through those things. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with your faith if you're struggling with that. This is one of the biggest things that I had to learn in, in my um, struggles with this and my struggles with mental health is that I actually had to address the pain uh, because I actually struggle with the opposite of what you guys are saying. I'm a positive outlook person by nature. And so I'm just kind of like, everything's fine. <laughs> and then yeah, I this don't, is fine. <laughs> yeah, I really am that way. And then I have the problem of, I don't actually heal from it yeah. because I just kind of push it aside. And I realize that I can't do that. I can't good vibes it away. I can't try to tough it out. I can't ignore it or distract myself from it. I have to actually address it. And that process is painful yeah, because it's it like is. it's like getting stitches, I always say, because you can't just slap a Band-Aid over a really deep wound because it's not going to heal properly. You might have to get stitches, and that hurts all over again, <laughs> but it's necessary for actual healing to take place. And so we can't push it down. We can't bury it. Um, and this was something that my therapist said to me. It was a quote, um, and it really stuck with me. She said, unprocessed trauma is like creating a zombie. You can bury it all you want, but it's not going to die. It's just going to come back up in uglier forms. 
for like how many seasons now? <laughs> how many seasons are we on The Walking Dead? I mean, it's going to keep coming back. Yes, it absolutely will. And so that was that's one of the biggest things that stuck with me, um, that we actually have to ad address our pain before we can get to the place that Shalisha was talking about, before we can actually choose to see the things in that light. We have to actually heal from it. And one of the coolest um, representations of this that I saw recently was in an episode of The Chosen. And I won't spoil it if you haven't watched season three, but... Um, one of our main characters went through something really traumatic. She was depressed and angry with God for months and months, and it wasn't going away. And um, a family member brought her to the synagogue for a scripture reading because she thought that it would help. And um, so they go, and the priest says, what scripture would you like me to read today? And the family member's like, how about something about joy? How about a cheerful verse? And he looks at our character, and he says, I have a feeling that's not what you need right now. And she's like, No. And so this is what he reads instead. <laughs> I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched the Lord all night long. I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. You don't let me sleep. I'm too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days long since ended when my nights were filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and ponder the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? I, I don't remember singing those lyrics in any of our songs. <laughs> no, I don't, we don't sing that. No. We don't do that. Be but that was what she needed in that moment. And it was because she needed to know that people of faith also struggled with what she was struggling with. Wow. This is also in the true word of God. Yeah. There's an entire book called Lamentations, a book of laments. Laments are poems of grief and sorrow. An entire book of people crying out to God thinking that they, he had abandoned them. Um, and that is also included in the true word of God. Our pain is, is true. Um, and then there's another story that we like to reference. We call it a nap and a snack, and it's about Elijah. Um, we love this story. We love this story. <laughs> um, but it says in 1 Kings about Elijah... Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat up, down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Mm. And then I'll just paraphrase the next part. Basically, an angel comes to him and gives him food, water, and tells him to go to sleep. <laughs> and then when he wakes up, he's ready for his journey. Um, so I love that story because it teaches us, A, that Elijah a powerful, strong faith yeah. man of yeah. God yeah. got to a place where he wanted to die. So we can have a little bit of comfort in that knowing that maybe we're not alone when we're in the deepest, darkest places of our faith and of our life. But it also shows us that our physical health can severely affect our mental health. And um, while, again, while we recognize that the spiritual realm is absolutely real and that is constantly working, um, there are also physical, scientific things that are happening within our body that we might need to address. And for him, the needs that needed to be met were food, water, and rest, a nap, and a snack. And let's, and let's not forget, it was, it was door dashed to him by God. Yeah. Like, it doesn't get any more of a spiritual, practical connection he than woke that. up and it was there, yeah. And so, again, he provides those things for us. Yeah. Um, so for him, that's what he needed. It may be as simple as that for us, um, but it may be as complicated as needing, like, medical attention. And God absolutely works through those things. So all of this to say, I think what I have learned and the thing that I've had to deal with with my mental health um, is that I actually have to feel the uncomfortable feelings, um, and not necessarily validate those feelings because I know that they can be deceitful and the enemy loves to work through those. I know that what I was feeling about not accepting truth was a straight up lie from the enemy, but I had to process it and I had to face it and name it for what it was. So I didn't necessarily validate those feelings, but I had to process them and we have to do that. Otherwise we'll create mental and emotional zombies essentially. That keep coming back. Yeah. See, I, I love that we have these biblical examples, but if, if keeping it real, like 
it's easy to look at like Elijah's story and think, man, that was, that was like this Old Testament thing. Like, and, and it also came to him right after a high. Like we talked about how like a diagnosis, you know, like you called it secondhand pain, stress, just difficult times in life, things like that, they trigger first the thought process. Those thoughts can grow into disorders and disorders can take over our lives and the illnesses, like the whole pathway. And, but, he, and, but even if, you know, like Elijah came, it hit him right after a high in his life. He had just had like a victory, like a showdown. And he was the king. He was the champ. He, he just won the NBA finals. And like he, he now goes into a depression. It hit him out of nowhere. And so we can even look at his life and think like, yeah, but that, but that was then, or it's, it's different in the Old Testament, or I don't know, whatever we, whatever we could just justify, but, but Jesus, you, you brought up something from Jesus, Shalisha, and like, the one thing about Jesus is, he physically, as a son of God, he, he came into this world to embody everything about us, including, including mental challenges, and there's proof. So I, I have one more verse, and this, this is from Jesus, and this is in Matthew 26, verse 38. And he's with a couple of disciples, and he says to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Now watch how far. To the point of death. It sounds like Elijah. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I want to die. Overwhelmed to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. The reason that Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death is because he was facing death. Again, we have Jesus was about to encounter trauma, hardship, pain, devastation, things we've all been through or that, I'm sorry, are on our horizon at any given point. He was facing these things because specifically, this was just hours away from the point that Jesus would be arrested. You wanna talk about stress? Get arrested. Not only would he be arrested, he was gonna be beaten brutally, beyond recognition. He knew that in, in just several hours ahead, nails would pierce his hands, his body. He'd start to bleed. He said, I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death because when he got nailed to a cross, he hung to the point of death. And when he died, his body was placed in a lonely, dark, lifeless tomb. And I, I want to finish with you guys today being close to and giving a moment to anyone, even just one, who may be here and you can see yourself in any of these different levels of mental health challenges. Maybe you just wish you could fall asleep, but you can't because your mind is racing with what to do next. Maybe anxiety follows you around like a zombie. Maybe depression has stole your sunlight permanently. It can feel like being in a tomb. Now I'm a lot like Kurt. I, I can speak on this vividly because for a long time I had to, I had to love my wife through this darkness. She had anxiety disorder. She had very severe depression that I saw her question her life. It can feel like you're in a tomb because it's dark. It feels hopeless because you've been dealing with it for so long. Or maybe it's just started and you just don't have any real answers. It can feel lonely because the people around you just don't understand what's wrong with you. Why can't you smile? Why don't you answer us? Why don't you want to hang out? Why won't you come out of your room? You can't explain it. So you feel alone. You feel lifeless. Because if this thing wins, I don't know what's the point of me even living. I want to give you a promise of God. 
I know it feels like you're in a tomb. And it's okay if you feel like that. But what you need to know is that the tomb that Jesus was in, he didn't stay in. He left it. He walked out of it. Alive. An even better version of himself. And if he can walk out of that tomb, I want you to look again. You look at your life. I know it feels like a tomb, but you're not in a tomb. You're in a tunnel. You see that light? I know it's far away, it's small, because this tunnel that you're in seems just so long and so dark and so lifeless and so lonely. But you keep your eyes on that light. You continue to step towards that light. Because God promises that this tunnel is only going to last for a night. It's only a season. And there's joy coming in the morning. Morning is when Jesus walked out of that tomb. And because I trust this scripture, and because I seen it for myself and someone that I love, I know that you will make it to that light. I know you will. And you're going to make it the exact same way that Jesus left that tomb, one step at a time. You're going to make it one prayer at a time, one conversation at a time. You might need one counseling session at a time. It's okay if you need one therapy session at a time. It's okay if you have to try one medication at a time. You're going to make it. And before you know it, those faithful steps, one step at a time, is going to be one day at a time. And that light's going to get brighter. And then it's going to be one week at a time, and you're getting closer. That light is going to get brighter. And before you know it, it's going to be one month at a time, and that light is going to get brighter because you're getting closer, because you were faithful, and until you arrive completely in the fullness of light of the best version of yourself that you didn't know was in there, but because you were faithful to God and you didn't quit on the little steps, he got you through. And now you're an even better version of yourself than when you went in. Maybe for some of you, the very first step is recognizing that you need Jesus. You need the Jesus that can walk out of a tomb to get you through this dark tunnel. And not only this tunnel here, the tunnel that leads to eternal life. And accepting Jesus is just a simple, yes, I believe what I just told you, that he died for you, that he left the tomb for you, that he wants to give you healing now and for eternity. And if you're here and that's not you, you haven't said that, yes, I want to give you the opportunity right now in your heart. If you believe it, you say yes to God right now. You accept Jesus. Let his spirit unite with yours. You're going to make it. That was your first step. You're going to make it no matter who you are, one step at a time. You're going to make it one prayer at a time. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. Pray through this darkness. Pray through this mental challenge. Pray through it one prayer at a time, one day at a time, one step at a time. And just so you all are aware, if you need help, beyond this here on a service two things we have a care and counseling team follow this information on this screen we have a team of people that would love to talk with you hear your heart maybe help point you in the right direction for any of you here today that you made the most important step in putting your faith in Jesus. I'm going to back up and we're going to, we're going to put a QR on the screen. Scan that and let us know you said yes to Jesus today. Hear the voice of God. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Step towards him. Be faithful. As we close this, if you, if you need prayer today, our prayer team is here. We have the care and counseling team. But you can't take steps without first standing. And no matter where you are in your life, you take a stand for your mental health, for your peace. I'm going to invite you right now to stand as we close and as we sing. You, you may feel like you're surrounded in your mind by thoughts 
by anxieties, by depression. That may be true. But God, God is surrounding all of that because he's surrounding you. One step. 